Good evening, everyone. I'm not going to be long because we have a guest. I just want to say a few brief words. Um, I said it last year, part of it I said last year, um, to those who might remember, but I just want to mention it now. Um, Yom HaShoah, we hear all kinds of combinations with Yom, Yom HaShoah VeHagvua, um, Shoah Utkuma, um, we find, um, by the way, what I'm going, what I'm saying is not related to directly to the to the talk. It's it's related to directly to Yom Hashoah, but I think it is important to say um, we find it difficult to deal with Yom Hashoah per se. We always we, we need to combine it with something to make it bearable. It wasn't a total disaster. There was some um, there was gvua. It wasn't a total disaster because afterwards we managed and we persevered. We did manage and we did persevere. And there was gvoa there, but this day mainly focused. We persevered, Baruch Hashem, as a people, but communities were destroyed. Individuals were murdered. And those communities, we have to understand the loss to us as a nation was not merely, the individuals would have been gone by now anyway. They wouldn't suffer traditions. What was live was lost for us as, as Jews. We like to always um, set ourselves up in groups. So we have Sfar the Sephardi Jews and Ashkenazi Jews that we, I mean, Hakim. It is so different if you are a Moroccan Jew, a Tunisian, we have Ashkenazi Jews. So yes, yeah, so we have a bit, Yekis, a bit terrorists. They were all gone forever, whether it was here in Israel, whether it was in the United States or in other countries. You didn't have too many communities that survived. You had individuals and each individual came from a different community. And so one came from Poland, one came from Galicia, one came from Lithuania. Each one of them had their own traditions, but when they put together a community, that community is not, won't have the traditions that they had. Traditions were lost. In a sense, a limb was cut, or more than a limb, was cut off our people forever. Maidanek in front of that huge pile of ashes and bone parts and other, that, that, that is there, a, 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 a horrific monument. And I was standing there and I remember I spoke to the, to the community of, I, I was there with my then Manchester community and I, and I gave a whole, there is, it, it, it pales next to that. It was a tragedy. It was something terrible. And I think it is our duty to remember our tragedies as well as our happy moments as a nation. We just remembered our geula. We had sad moments such as, such as we remember on Tisha B'Av. And we live those memories the same way we live the memories of our Geula on Pesach, we live the memories of tragedy on Tisha B'Av and on days like this when we remember Yom HaShoah, we remember those parts of our collective self that were torn apart from us and that are not with us for now. So I think for me, that is a very important part of Yom HaShoah. As I said, it's not related to what we're going to talk about, but I think it is important to bear in mind. And tomorrow when we hear that Sfira and Yom HaShoah, I think these are the, for me, those are the type of thoughts that go through, through my mind. 
thank you very much, Dr. Gustavo Peredin, for being with us tonight. Um, there was supposed to be another speaker who was arranged weeks ago. I won't say who it is, but it's someone from the community, believe it or not. And it, for whatever reason, there was something happened and it didn't work out. Um, but we were lucky because whoever is in the community will have, we could, we could have, uh, uh, um, is closer to us and we'll have opportunities to hear. But Dr. Perednik, we, it's, it's a very rare opportunity for us to hear Dr. Perednik who came from quite far away, a whole different part of the land of Israel from Ifat, right? Lives in Ifat. Um, we go back, is it 16 or 17 years when I was in Amiel, Dr. Peretnik used to come and lecture there. Um, fascinating talks about, especially about anti-Semitism and uh, a um, international speaker speaks in various languages in various countries, I think in 50 countries altogether, you uh, talked in uh, up till now, uh, hundreds of places. And uh, so we are very lucky to hear you tonight. Thank you very, very much. And uh, without further ado, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Rabbi Hanan Alexander. And I'm so happy to be back here. I was, I didn't remember the name of the community, but very much it's warmth. I, I think it was three and a half years ago, Sharon and Barry were one part of uh, my hosts and several other friends. So I, I'm the lucky one to be back. And uh, when we, Hanan, uh, we decided the topic of uh, tonight, I immediately felt that we had made an academic statement, uh, probably without realizing. And the statement is more or less as follows. There are hundreds of courses on the Shoah. Universities throughout the world, there are tour groups, one, one was just mentioned, and there are field trips on Judeophobia or anti-Semitism. There are not so many course, courses at universities and it's extremely, extremely surprising. First of all, because if you talk about the Shoah, which is a, a subject very much talked about, you cannot understand, even you cannot get to close to understanding if you are not very much aware of what Judeophobia or anti-Semitism means. And most people do study Holocaust studies without <clears throat> a previous training on what anti-Semitism or Judeophobia is all about. And therefore, when we are on Yom HaShoah talking about Judeophobia, I think we're making a very clear point and a very important one that I hope in many communities would do, which is talking about what brought to the Shoah and not only about the result. And therefore, What's surprising about this uh, lack of knowledge on this specific group hatred we are going to talk about is that we are dealing with the oldest hatred on earth, group hatred, the most universal, the most stubborn, violent, successful, the, de the deepest hatred and therefore, how could it be that such a unique phenomenon is not learned? You know that one year ago, the University of Oxford published a survey that revealed that one out of five Britons, one out of five believed that the pandemics were a cre was a creation of the Jews in order to make money. Now, I thought when I read this survey, I was not particularly flabbergasted because I, I'm all the time dealing with the, with the issue and the times of crisis are specifically fertile for Judeophobic feelings. But what did 
disappoint me was that it didn't prompt the university to start courses on Judophobia. It just published, well, you know, this is what happens. Doesn't it uh, provoke, doesn't it, doesn't it make you think that you should open courses on it or what, one or a series on lectures? No, apparently it's taken for granted. Not long ago, the Vatican commanded, requested from a Catholic artist to make a very grandiose piece of art that reflects today Christianity. And this was uh, Giovanni Gasparo, a young artist that made the magnificent piece and he chose to paint a blood libel, the trend blood libel of Sim the, the child Simon who was supposedly murdered by Jews who drank his blood. This was what this Gasparo the main representation of the church today. Now, the, there is a, a, a young artist who is a Judeophobe. It's not particularly depressing. Of course, there are many, but the church didn't react. They said, oh, okay, maybe you should have chosen something else. Maybe, probably something. <laughs> no scolded him, not expelled them, not excommunicated him. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. This passivity towards Judeophobia is really, surprising till today. Edward Flannery, an American uh, um, priest that wrote a fantastic book on Judophobia called The Anguish of the Jews, starts the book by saying that with Judophobia there is this cognitive dissonance because we Christians, says Flannery, feel honestly that our dear Jewish friends are a little bit paranoid about it and that they exaggerate this. This was a subject of the past, he says. And then of course he adds, but since I started studying it, I came here to make a bridge between us, the Christians who don't understand the dimensions of Judophobia and our friends, the Jews that are sometimes make feel uncomfort, felt uncomfortable because of their worries about it. But not only it doesn't have studies, not only we don't have courses on Judophobia, till one and a half centuries ago, this monstrous hatred didn't have a name. It had already destroyed hundreds of Jewish communities in Europe, but people spoke only about the hatred against the Jews. And in 1880, Two words were coined to define this specific hatred. One is anti-Semitism coined by a German Judophobe, Wilhelm Marr, and the other one, Judophobia, coined by our Leo Pinsker. Marr wrote about anti-Semitism in a pamphlet which he titled the victory of Judaism over Ger Germandom from a non-religious point of view, in which he claims basically these Jews are our enemies, we're always an enemies and will always be our enemies. But I don't want to call it anti-Judaism what I feel because this will sound too religious. I'm not against the Jewish religion. If a Jew converts to Christianity and his children converts to Islam and his grandchildren convert to Buddhism, for me, is exactly the same. There will always be these Jewish enemies. And therefore, he coined this word anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, between Judophobia and anti-Semitism, the one which is very faulty, the, which is flawed, is the one that took roots and everyone speaks about anti-Semitism, except for me, probably. Uh, I insist that the word anti-Semitism not only is wrong because there are no Semites anywhere and there were no anti-Semites ever on history, people who came against the Semites. Not only it is wrong, it is also misleading. It allows tyrants like Gaddafi or Assad both said at some point, how can I be an anti-Semite if I am a Semite? which is just a play on words, the pun, in order to confuse. 
because anti-Semitism, it doesn't have anything to do with Semites, it has to do with Jews, and we don't have to go that far. Our Tamar Zandberg at the Knesset, maybe three, four years ago, claimed that we shouldn't take for ourselves the word anti-Semitism because we are not only this, we are not the only Semite people on earth. I mean, when I heard this sentence, I thought in one sentence, she's proving more or less what I'm trying to refute during the last 40 years of my professional life. I don't have to explain to you what a play, stupid play on words this statement was. One more point about the word. Anti-Semitism has another problem. Not only that it was created by a Judophobe and that is misleading and wrong, but it also, with the prefix anti and the suffix ism in any language that I checked, including Hebrew, it means an idea that comes to refute another idea. Anti-modernism, anti-communism, anti-whatever. But anti-Semitism is not an idea and it comes not to refute absolutely anything. It's a group hatred. And if you call it anti-Semitism, you give it an ideological aura that has to be avoided. <clears throat> Before the Holocaust, people in Europe would say, I am an anti-Semite. And someone else would answer, well, I don't agree with you, but I respect your opinion. But there was no opinion whatsoever in trying to attack a group. Now it is not used so much. There are not so many people who would claim that they are anti-Semitic. Others would say you are as an accusation, and that is a, a, a progress in, in vocabulary. There are other reasons, but I, I, I think that it made the point why I'm going to use Judophobia, and I won't correct any of you, any of you that want to keep on. Uh, uh, using anti-Semitism. By the way, I don't mind to be interrupted uh, at any point if you want to make a brief comment or question. Why is it so successful? Why is Judophobia such a successful hatred? First of all, because it is founded upon a mythology that it is very deep. If I am a demagogue and I want to blame a group for the evils of a society. And I choose that that group can be the vegetarians or the tennis play, play, players or well, short people or people who wear glasses. I will have to make such a big propaganda and so many meetings and publishing so much and speaking so much about it that it's worthless. That it, from the outset, it will be a failure. Now, they want to blame the Jews for the wrongdoings in a society. I don't have to invest absolutely anything. I just have to say it. And people will immediately know. It's either because they control the world or they have a conspiracy to control the world or they are all racist or they are a virus or they kill Christ or they are transmit diseases whatsoever. There are about 10, 12 not 1 million, but 10, 12 myths that conform an, a mythology that it's so deep and they are available that it's even tempting for demagogues to use it all the time. So the answer is anti-Semitism or Judophobia is around because it's very easy. It's very easy to spread. And if you want to blame someone, blame the Jews and you'll see how successful that can be. Try to blame another group and you feel that you are on your way to a failure. Now, the question would be, but why is it so easy? How come this mythology was uh, built? We'll deal with it. In the meantime, I want to point out something that is especially relevant for us Israelis, which is that Judophobia today is still leaning on its mythology but the mythology is not anymore channeled against the Jew as an individual, the Jew as a community, not even the Jew as a religion, not against the Jewish religion, but against the national state of the Jews. Judophobia today is in its 
the vast majority of the cases, anti-Zionism. We'll also deal with it. In the meantime, I just want to tell you, anti-Zionism renewed the old myths. In medieval times, we were accused of killing Christian children in order to use their blood. Today, Israelis love killing Palestinian children. The myth is basically the same. If you report on a newspaper that the Israelis killed 20 Palestinian children or Lebanese children or whatever, out of context, which is basically how the European media reports on Israel, out of context, the only conclusion is that we attack because we are evil. There is no reason for our attacks. So the myth is still the same. In the past, we were accused of trying to control the world. Now it's the state of Israel, an imperialistic state. Now, if you look at the map, it sounds funny. I mean, you know, to be an imperialistic state, you need at least, I don't know, one millionth of an empire. And in the map, you see just a point that you, you cannot bear even the name Israel on it, and you accuse Israel of being the imperialism, but it doesn't matter. A myth is a lie, and a lie is a lie. If the myth is already there, you now can use it against the, the, Jew, the Jew of the states. Now, in order to be successful, a group hatred must fulfill four conditions. One, it has to be possible. That means if I say that this particular group is stupid, people will believe it. Second, it has to be effective. Not only that they will believe it, but they will be able to channel their frustrations, their hatred. The, the darker side of society will be able to find a way to burst out against a group. Third, it has to be necessary. There must be people who need to hate, and therefore I'm giving them food by presenting, introducing them to a group to whom they can hate for free. And fourth, and this only Judeophobia fulfills out of all the group hatreds, it has to be for free, gratuitous. What do I mean by this? In order to be successful, this group hatred must not arise any type of guilt feelings. It cannot be a burden on me. And most of group hatred, racism, misogyny, or whatever, at some point, xenophobia against foreigners, raise some type of guilt feelings. How much, how, for how long can I hate this Pakistani who is in the street selling uh, uh, cheap goods? If I am in a much better condition than him, at some point, either I will feel, well, it's too much to blame him for, for everything, or someone will tell me, this doesn't happen with the Jew at all. The Jew can be very weak. He can be agonizing and you still feel that you're attacking the most powerful group on earth. You still feel that you go on a pogrom in Russia to kill Jewish peasants, but your target is the Rothschilds. So you think you're fighting because this is the mythology. Jews are controlling everything. So how can they be the victim of anything? In any case, in any situation, no matter what, I am the victim and I'm defending myself. And this is very specific of Judeophobia and therefore it's so much successful than other, any other group hate. I mentioned already once or twice, xenophobia, the hatred of foreigners. By the way, I heard some of you thinking that phobia in Greek means you are thinking that, you know? Uh, Phobia in Greek means fear and not hatred. That is true for psychology. In psychology, when we apply it, we say aulurophobia is fear of cats, arachnophobia is fear 
of, of um, spiders, nyctophobia is fear of night. Everyone has his own, but not in social sciences. Once you transfer this into social sciences, it becomes hatred. That is why we call xenophobia to the hatred of strangers, of, of foreigners, not the fear of foreigners. This has to be probably the fact that in every hatred there is some type of fear, but that is beyond our discussion tonight. The main thing is that phobia in social sciences does mean hatred and it's perfectly applied in the word judophobia. We all know William Shakespeare. He wrote between 30 and 40 dramas. The most popular of them, The Merchant of Venice. It was not by far not the best, even one of the low ones, but the most popular one for many reasons, which we are not going to elaborate now. For those of you who not are very acquainted with The Merchant of Venice, I'll sum up what's needed for what I'm going to claim immediately. Here you have a merchant in Venice, Antonio, and his friend Bassanio, a young friend who wants to get married. For that, he needs a loan you know, to travel, you know, to request the hand of this fair lady. And these 30,000 ducats, which he needs as a loan, would be more or less $300,000 Today, it was calculated. Antonio says, no problem. The only obstacle we have is that all my ships are now coming back to Venice and I don't have cash. So we'll go to the Jew, Shylock, and we'll ask him for the money. If he gives you the money, don't worry. I'll take it upon me. Shylock says, no problem. I'll give you the money with one condition. I want you, Antonio, to sign this contract in which it says, that if you don't give me back my money on time, I can get from your flesh the worth of this loan. In other words, I can kill you. Bassanio said, no way, how will you do something like that? And Antonio said, don't worry, I'm, I'm, all my ships are coming back now. It's peanuts, he signs. Of course, as expected, all the ships sunk, the money doesn't come back, the loan cannot be repaid, and Shylock is adamant, I want the contract to be fulfilled. He doesn't want money at all to present Shylock as a miser, he's just misreading what it says, because he's offered all the money on earth, and he said, I don't want one cent, I want the contract to be fulfilled, in other words, I want Antonio's blood, and he says, why? Because Antonio is a dutiful, he hates me. He hates all the Jews. He makes fun of us. And therefore, I'm taking legal revenge once after 1,500 years. Now I can do it. I'll do it. Of course, not, not a very nice character, this uh, Shylock. But believe me, I wrote about it. Shakespeare presents him in a much nicer light than he presents all the Christians in the play. Therefore, the merchant of Venice is not at all a judophobic place. It became judophobic for several reasons, but it was not the intention of the author. You can see throughout the play. But one, this is so far, I didn't say the main, I didn't mention the main point of what it has to do with us. People would, audiences would go to the theater damn the Jew to insult him, to spit at him, a child look to throw him things, catharsis. And surprisingly enough, no one of them ever saw a Jew in their lives, not their parents, nor their grandparents. Shakespeare had himself written a stereotype of a Jew without having met a Jew ever, not his parents, not his grandparents. The Jews had been expelled from England in the year 1290, and the merchant of Venice was spent in 1596. That means 300 years of England, Judenheim, 
and Judeophobia is still kicking, dynamic, this hatred against Shylock all the time. How could that happen? How can it be that this hatred is so stubborn that it doesn't need even the target of the hatred to be there? That this doesn't happen to any other group hatred on earth. In order to be a racist, you need a society in which there are several races. You cannot be a misogynist if there are no women around. You cannot be a, a xenophobic person if in your society there are no foreigners at all. But in order to be a Judeophobe, you don't need one Jew. On the contrary, many times it helps that you don't have any, any Jew. Why? Because what the Judeophobe attack is not the blood and flesh uh, Jew. He attacks a myth, a stereotype and that he has in his mind. This world controlling Christ killer Jew, always a problem always a conspirator, he has this Jew in his mind and he attacks anything in the name of this hatred he had built. Therefore, I want to point out very clearly, and maybe this is one of the most important points in our meeting today, what is the difference between Judeophobia and Xenophobia? If you ask a Xenophobe, why does he hate uh, foreigners? he would probably bring one of these two types of arguments. Either the economic types, because foreigners take my jobs away, because foreigners destroy our economy, or the sociological type of arguments, because foreigners ruin our culture, or because foreigners increase the, crime, the crime rate of our society. Now, what is the xenophobe saying? There is a reality and he is misinterpreting this reality. There is something there and he's explaining it in a wrong way, but he's based upon some reality. There is an employment. The fact is that foreigners are not to be blamed about the unemployment. Usually they are the victims of the economic situation. They are not the ones who provoke it, but the unemployment is there. There is crime. The problem is that he is blaming for criminality people who don't have anything to do with it or, or has as much to do as any other person. But there is a reality upon which he can stand in order to misinterpret it, to mispresent it. If you ask a Judeophobe why he hates Jews, he would tell you that Jews either control the world or bring wars to the world or kill God, nothing less than that, or they're a virus, or all the myths we know, we, this dozen of myths which I referred to before. What is the difference between the argument of the Xenophobe and the Judeophobe? The Judeophobe is not misinterpreting reality. He's just based upon fantasy from the beginning. It's not true that there is another small group controlling the world, but I'm blaming the Jews as opposed to this other group. It's just fantasy that I create, that someone is controlling me all the time, and I blame the Jews. It is not true that someone else killed God, but you are blaming the Jews. You just start by saying, you asked Jews killed God. How can you answer to an argument which is completely based upon fantasy? There is no way you can argue with a xenophobe. Maybe you can never convince him, but you can argue with him. You cannot argue with a Judeophobe. It's a lost case from the beginning. What are you going to say? You killed God. So you'll answer, well, I was not there that day because I was in holidays. What, what will be your argument in order to uh, refute it? Do you control the world? The Holocaust never happened. Is there any Holocaust denier that at some point will be convinced by argumentation that the Shoah did take place? Do you really believe in this naivete that that's, that could happen? This is the main difference between Judeophobia and xenophobia and what makes Judeophobia such a unique phenomenon. 
I have several questions I would like to answer tonight. Not all of them probably will be able to, but one of them is when this phenomenon started. Because people you usually ask, why does Uniform exist? I lecture on this in many universities and always when I answer to a student who says, why does it exist? And I answer very quickly, it exists because it's a very easy thing. You can blame the Jews and, and the mythology is there. I feel immediately that he's unsatisfied with this uh, answer because he really means by his question, when did it start? But if I answer when did it start, I'm going to do now, he's also very unsatisfied because he doesn't explain why it's still now here. So you have to combine both explanations. When did it start? There are nine answers. And each one of these nine answers have thinkers that subscribe to them, wrote books about them, whatsoever. Seven of them, I'm sorry, six of them, trace Judeophobia to very old age. No, not old age, you say, to very old times, to the antiquity. And you can find them in the Bible. Basically, there are uh, uh, six biblic, seven biblical archetypes that we can bring as an um, example of what this Judeophobia means. Avimelech, Faho, Amalek, Isabel, Sambalat, Haman. That means in historical terms, 4,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago, 2,800 years ago, 26, 25, 2,400 years ago. These are the possibilities. I won't start elaborating on this one, on each one because it's boring, but basically here we have six possible answers and they are all basically wrong. Because to find one specific case of Judophobia doesn't mean that Judophobia started there. You need an historical continuum that doesn't exist in these cases. Therefore, there is a seventh school, which is even more wrong, represented by Hannah Arendt in the 20th century, that says basically, Judophobia started 200 years ago. Well, she wouldn't let me use the word Judophobia, she would say anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a political movement that started in Germany 200 years ago, says Hannah Arendt, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the hatred of the Jews in medieval times. I don't have to explain why this is absolutely wrong because it is true that in Germany 200 years ago, the political use of Judeophobia started. But you, you cannot use politically something that is not there. And the hatred was there before they started using politically. And therefore, we come to the only two plausible academic answers about when the Judeophobia start. Out of the nine, we discarded eight, um, seven, and there are two left. Either it started with Hellenism 3,200, 2,300 years ago, or it started with Christianity 2,000 years ago. And these both are very plausible. In both cases, they have a case. In Hellenism, we have a situation in Alexandria 2300 years ago, when Jews started to be hated by several historians who wrote for the first time the history of Egypt, their country of Greek Egypt, Hellenistic Egypt. They wrote in Greek, and they included some chapters blaming the Jews for almost everything. This had an explosion in what we misnamed today the pogrom of Alexandria of the year 38, or the Flaccus pogrom. For instance, the very well respected historian Benzion Netanyahu, the father of 
he brings a very strong case to set the beginning of Judophobia in that year, in that pogrom in Alexandria. On the other hand, now, let me see how long I was going, I'm doubting whether to start or why it started there. We'll see if we can after it. it on the other hand, if it started on, with Christianity, the case is even simpler because it is obvious that the fathers of the church, whenever they wrote about the Jews, they accused them or they demonized them with not one exception. This is very, uh, very clear different. Among the Greek historians, there were many exceptions to this Judeophobic attitude. Among the first fathers of the church, there was not one exception. When they mentioned the Jews, it was in order to degrade them, in order to uh, demonize them. It came to the very worst stage in the fourth, fourth century when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, and therefore the Roman Empire became ideological with this ideology which was, which was full of Judeophobia, and, it, and slowly became the European ideology. It's not uh, surprising that Europe is the main usine of Judeophobia, and they export Judeophobia to everywhere with more or less success, depend the area. But Judeophobia is basically a European disease. Now, of course, the historians who claim that Judeophobia started with Christianity don't overlook the previous pagan, Alexandrian uh, Judeophobia, but they say it was not general, it was not deep, it was not an obligation. With Christianity, at the beginning of Christianity, and this, of course, doesn't mean that every Christian was ever a Judeophobe. Of course it doesn't. And today you have hundreds of millions of Christians who love the Jews because of their Christianity. But we're talking about the roots. Where did it start? And why could it have been started in Christianity? Because it's a very easy to solve dilemma. The beginning of Christianity was, we are the heirs of the Old Testament. We are the continuators of the prophets. We are the heirs of the patriarchs. In order to be the heir of something, you need the inherited person to be deceased, to have died. If he's alive, he's, the, the very fact that he lives will question every day the legitimacy of your inheritance. And that was a problem for the Christians. If the Jew is alive, what are we continuing? They are continuing. This type of tension didn't happen with the Greeks and didn't happen with the Muslims either. It only happened with Christianity. And therefore, I always say that every religion has the right to tell its own story as, he, as it likes. And in every religion will find some nice side of its story, no doubt. But Christianity has to be very careful when it tells its own story because it can open the gates of love and it can open the gates of hatred. If your own story is based upon a people who are deicide, a people who are damned by God, we can claim back saying that this is an enemy. They are presenting, it doesn't happen in the majority of the Christians even today. But you have a problem because when it does happen, you saw what the response of the church is to those Christians who still stick to their old theology. In the 20th century, two more myths were added to the long chain of myth. I don't know whether I said the Alexandrians first myth, which is uh, remarkable because it's the first one. The first myth against the Jews was that they are all lepers and therefore leprosy has to be uprooted by destroying the Jews or expelling the Jews. And this was what these Alexandrian historians claim. In the Middle Age, then you have the very first myth of Christianity is deicide, the Jews killed God. And in the Middle Ages, the main myth was the blood libel, which you all know about. 
and I, I don't have to elaborate. In the 20th, then the modern, modern times, which is the main myth, the Jewish conspiracy, the Jewish control of the world. It started in, in uh, France during Napoleonic times in 1807. Each one of these myths has a birth date. You can trace it, you can see when they started talking about it. And in the 20th century, you have two new myths. One is Holocaust denial. Jews were never killed. You are just crybabies all the time. They are claiming to themselves the history of suffering. The Jews think that they have the monopoly of sorrow, but it didn't happen. Of course, Holocaust denial has several uh, levels, and this extreme one of um, of claiming that Jews were not killed during the Second World War. Very few of them uh, um, uh, hold. They are much more sophisticated usually. For instance, what they say, of course there was an Holocaust. In every war there is an Holocaust. The Americans did one in Vietnam and the Vietnamese did one in Cambodia and the French did one in Algeria and every war, whoa, check the wars and you find them full of Holocaust. But there you have a Jew always complaining about his Holocaust because for him, the world is always surrounding his history, which is basically a big lie. There was no Holocaust in every world, in every war. That's why the word Holocaust, the word Holocaust had to be created after the Second World War, because there was no, the word genocide was not enough. By the way, also the word genocide was created for what happened in the Second World War. In many wars, wars there are genocides, but Holocaust, Shoah, there is only one. What is the difference? There had never been a situation in which a nation claims that to destroy the very last baby of another nation is the only way for his own people to prevail. Never ever this happened, let alone the dimension, let alone the, 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 the passivity of the world, let alone the fact that they were trapped in Europe with a way to uh, uh, escaping this fate. While the Germans killed them there, the Britons didn't let them in, into Palestine, no country opened its door generously to the Jews. Therefore, this situation had never happened. And the sadism involved in all this, I don't know. No. We, we said we were going to focus on Judeophobia more than on the Shoah. And therefore, to say in every word there is a Holocaust, it's just a lie. And to imply that we cannot even pay homage to our victims, because by doing so, we are being ethnocentric or something like that. It is an aggression, a Judeophobic aggression. So how can we deal with the Holocaust denial? By presenting as it is, Holocaust denial has nothing to do with the Shoah. It has to do with Judeophobia. It's another way of Judeophobia and as such has to be dealt with. So if someone claims that we are all pigs, we don't have to bring a zoologist to the find on the matter, and we don't have to open debates on whether we are or we are not. In the same way, if someone claims that there was no Holocaust, there is no discussion about it. There is no debate. There is an aggression. An aggression should be responded as an aggression. At least we have to be conscious and aware to how to respond to an aggression. The second myth is the most important one. The second 20th century myth, which is, there was a peaceful, hardworking people in Palestine for thousands of years, and suddenly invaders came from no one knows where, manipulated by dark financial powers. And this group of invaders exploited the poor inhabitants of this land. They destroyed them, they dispossessed them, they killed them, they mistreated them, etc., etc. Just read the, the newspapers and you'll know what I mean. This is the version that most Europeans have in mind. When they, uh, when they think of the Middle East 
conflict or the war against Israel, as I prefer to call it. This myth can also be refuted very easily, very easily. I'm, I'm again serious about this. I talk in, uh, in universities abroad about these issues, and I usually refute this by saying just one question, and the answer is unanimously, unanimously silence. Just bring me one document, not 100, not 10, not three, just one for me will be enough. One document that speaks about the Palestinian people on the second century, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, or 19th centuries, and I'll come back to apologize. These hardworking people who lived this here for centuries never existed. They happen to exist from the 20th century on. That doesn't mean that they don't have any rights. We can discuss that's a political question and it has nothing to do with this, but you don't have to rewrite history and you don't have to invent a history that never existed because when we do that, you'll steal our history. And therefore you'll come into conflict with us all the time more or less what Christians did. They created a new religion, but it was not enough to say, I have a new religion. In order to make it really convincing, you have to do, but my new religion is based upon the prophets. It's about the, the Old Testament. It's upon, about the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, they stole our history and it was embarrassing for them to confront them, uh, to confront us while we were still alive, more or less. Of course, there is a big difference between them, but more or less it's what happened with the so-called Palestinian history. So please don't lie. You can be pro-Palestinian as much as you want. You can claim for them a state and, and a cup of wine, whatever you want, but don't steal my history and don't invent something that never existed. But it is a myth. So you can repeat it and people will immediately uh, side with you or feel that at least you are making a case. There are several schools that try to understand and explain Judophobia. Basically, I would say you could classify them in three groups. The psychological schools, for instance, 75 years ago, Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher, wrote a book called The Portrait of the Antisemite, in which he claims that the anti-Semite or Judophobe, what he does is to project onto the Jew his own failures. This type of psychological approach has a problem, which is that Judophobia is not a psychological disease. Judophobes don't belong to psychiatric homes, they belong to jail. They are dangerous, they are evil, but they are not crazy. Voltaire was one of the brightest men on earth in his time, and he was a deep Judophobe. Marx was even a Jew, and he, the first book he writes is The Jewish Question, which is basically a, a treatise on a Judophobic treatise. I mean, people are very bright. Heidegger well, is considered by many. Uh, uh, the top philosopher of the 20th century, and he was a Nazi. And so I can con could continue with many, many examples. So Judophobia doesn't belong to crazy people. It is a, 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 an expression of evil, but not of madness. So comes the second group, which are the sociologic, the sociological approach. It is not something that is in your mind. It has to do with the role of the Jews in different societies throughout ages, which usually showed type, a type of power that they didn't have. And this apparent power made them be persecuted all the time. For instance, when they were tax uh, um, claimers on, on behalf of the kings, so they, they, they are, the face of the Jew was for the peasant, the face of power. But the, the Jew didn't have any power. So when the peasant had to rebel, 
it was much better for him to rebel against the Jew than to rebel against the king, because the king had an army and the Jew had Gornish, and he couldn't defend himself. And therefore, that's what made Judophobia so easy to be played uh, throughout history. The problem with the sociological schools is that Judophobia worked when the Jews were very poor and when they were very rich, when they were extremely secluded to themselves and when they were completely assimilated, when they were very open about their Judaism and when they were not. So in any type of situation, Judophobia works. So it's very difficult to explain. If you claim that any single type of role they uh, um, fulfilled in history is, well, if every role brings Judophobia, you have to deal with why Judophobia exists. It has nothing to do with the role of the Jew. And finally, the third group is the anthropological which claims basically Jews are persecuted or hated because they, they are a symbol, of, a symbol of something that people would, would like not to be there, which is morality. Even if a Jew makes an effort, he'll always be the representative of what's good and wrong because he's the first one to, who spoke on those terms in history, with the Hebrew Bible says what you should and what you shouldn't do because it's good or what is evil. And no one likes being told what's good and evil, what he should do, what he shouldn't do. And therefore, the Jew is either a symbol of that or he wakes up kind of fears because at some point, the fact that he was a victim of so much hatred will make him take revenge. So we have to fear them because he will. There are others, but basically these three groups try to explain. Of course, no school explains it completely, but they show the complexity of, of, of Judophobia. Judophobia is a very, very special type of group hatred because basically it doesn't discriminate. I mean, you know many Jews who are discriminated, really discriminated. There are there so many places where they cannot get to. They just are the freer of the freest of the freer. They can go anywhere. They can succeed anywhere. Economy, politics, whatever. Judophobia doesn't discriminate. It kills, which is much worse. It creates a hatred, a demonization that basically uh, that on, in the end is going to bring to violence. It it resource to violence much more uh, fast than any other group hatred. All this picture must have uh, created upon you the image and I'm a very, I have a very gloomy perspective on what's happening. Well, I'll surprise you. I'm an optimist. I uh, believe that Judophobia, although it's very deep and although we should speak about it a lot, it's, on, it's going backwards. It has some two steps backwards and one forward, three backwards and one forward. The, these last years were not easy, but nowadays we are in a much better situation than 50 years ago, 200 years ago, or 1000 years ago. So at some point, Judophobia will become marginal. It won't ever disappear, but it will become marginal in societies. And then the, the main thing that we can do in order to ensure its marginality is uh, explain it talk a lot about it, try to make it uh, taught in schools, in universities. And I'm very happy that uh, Ohel Ari took an initiative in, in that sense. And now it's your turn. If you want to ask, comment, whatever. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I think, uh, yeah, one, two, no, good. Uh, uh. If I do, yes, I do. Because it's, it's live and well. It's still alive. Oh. Yeah, I, I am telling you about in a, in a campus in America, Marlon Brando had made a geophobic uh, allegation on TV. I don't know when, Larry King's program. He said at some point, 
Jews control Hollywood. And that is why the Jewish films, I'm sorry, the American films, the Hollywood films, come with dirty blacks, lazy Indians, but the Jews are always nice people. He afterwards apologized and apologized and apologized, saying, how could I have said something like that? My best Jews, my best friends are Jews. People who employed me all my life are Jews. I don't know why I said it, but I, I apologize. So I bring, I brought this example in my campus in America. And I asked the students, why do you think he had to apologize? The, the answers I got there, <laughs> if you want to be depressed, were astonishing. The, the first answer I get was, because if he didn't apologize, he would have been fired. So basically, you know, he was right. Uh, I, I, I tell you this story not only because of the question, because it's very uh, representative of Judophobia. So I was more, a little bit more aggressive. Listen, how many of you are Jews? So about 40% raise your hands. So I started with two, each one of them. There are three, three words at least that he had to apologize for. First, he said that Jews control Hollywood. The word control is very aggressive. If you say that black people succeed in the Olympic games because they are very good at sports, no one will claim you are a racist. But if you say that they, they succeed because they control the Olympic committee, of course they would say you are a racist. Control, it's obvious what you mean. So when someone hears the word control, you have to apologize for that. What's this control? But the main thing he said that he has to apologize for is that he said the Jews control. He didn't say some Jews, the Jews. So you 40% sitting here, do you control Hollywood? Your baby controls Hollywood, your boyfriend controls Hollywood, your bar mitzvah brother controls Hollywood. He is getting a group and saying that we are, and, and no one of you realizes why he has to apologize. Judophobia is very pervasive. People were just there listening to what he said and they didn't see anything wrong so I agree with you. It's very, very necessary to speak about it and explain it. Sorry for the digression. It was too long for as an answer. Anyone else? Thank you very, very much. You're very, very welcome. Thought-provoking. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming out here for the first event, non tula event, not on Shabbat, that we have in Shul, may it continue this way.